Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, this is the Vermont House Human Services Committee, and it is Thursday, January 13th. Uh, this morning, um, between nine, um, for the first sort of hour, hour and a half of our session, we are um, going to be discussing um, uh, Proposition um, 5, uh, the uh, Reproductive Liberty um, Com Constitutional Amendment proposal. And we're going to, um, this is an introduction, while this is, um, this is an introduction that may be repetitive, but we is, it is good for those of us who went through this two years ago, but we, since we do have two new um, members, I think it's important that we set the stage in terms of uh, review of constitutional procedures, um, uh, and, as well as an, um, how that also impacts the role of the legislature. And then followed by that um, will be um, Michelle Childs will go over the language itself um, and a walkthrough. So thank you all. And um, uh, we're going to start with legislative council from um, who, who pr predominantly uh, staffs uh, government operations and uh, Amarin Abergelli. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. For the record, Amarin Abergelli, Legislative Council. So you'll see I have posted a document to your webpage um, about the procedure to amend the Vermont Constitution. Uh, you may notice this was a document originally prepared by Betsy Ann Rask, my predecessor, who is also with us this morning in her role as the House Clerk. Uh, so some of these materials were prepared in preparation for these proposals when they were uh, there are two proposals currently for uh, amending the constitution, Prop 2 and Prop 5. Uh, so many materials were prepared in 2019 when these two proposals were first introduced. So I will begin with a high level overview of the process that's required under the constitution. You'll see within this document, there's also a description of how the house rules and Senate rules uh, govern how each chamber is going to comply with those constitutional requirements. Um, <clears throat> I won't get into those rules too much unless you would like a walkthrough of those also, um, but I can give a high level uh, description of those in this document. And then if you have further questions, particularly around house rules uh, for the house clerk, she uh, hopefully will be able to answer any of those questions. Uh, thank you. And uh, I will take my lead from the committee in terms of after the high level overview, what kinds of um, open it up for questions. Great. So I'm just going to start off on the first page of this overview. So you'll see that uh, section 72 of chapter two of the Vermont constitution controls how uh, the state can amend the constitution. So at a very high level, uh, the section requires the approval of the General Assembly in two consecutive bienniums, followed by voter ratification. So looking at the text of that section 72, below there, 72 amending constitution, at the biennial session of the General Assembly of the state, which convenes in AD 1975, and at the biennial session convening every fourth year thereafter, the Senate, by a vote of two thirds of its majority, may propose amendments to this constitution with the concurrence of a majority of the members of the House of Representatives with the amendment as proposed by the Senate. So a proposed amendment that is adopted by the Senate and concurred in by the House of Representatives is then going to be referred to the next biennial session of the General Assembly. For context in looking at Prop 5, where you are in this process, the in 2019-2020 biennial session, the Senate proposed um, an amendment to the Constitution, the House concurred in that amendment, and now here we are in the second biennium where uh, the proposal is being referred to this General Assembly uh, to continue the process. <clears throat> so, and if that last session, meaning the current session we're in, a majority of the members of the Senate and a majority of the House of Representatives concur in the proposed amendment, it shall be the duty of the General Assembly to submit the proposal directly to the voters of the state. 
any proposed amendment submitted to the voters of the state in accordance with this section, which is approved by a majority of the voters voting thereon shall become part of the constitution of this state. So uh, in addition to that, prior to the submission of a proposed amendment to vote in accordance with this section, public notice of the proposed amendment shall be given by proclamation of the governor. <clears throat> and then the General Assembly shall provide for the manner of voting on amendments proposed under this section and shall enact legislation to carry the provisions of this section into effect. So the next uh, section three, a summary of the um, of section 72 uh, is a, a, a combination sort of of the process and where we are right now in the process. So um, I think once again, at a high level, you are in the second, the second portion of this of this legislative process. We are in the second half of the biennium. Um, it is now going to be the House's uh, opportunity to review proposal two for the second time. Now in the second biennium, and uh, I will just ask the committee if they wish to hear the Senate uh rules governing how this goes or should i skip down to the house rules I, committee i don't, I don't I, care how the senate does it i want to know how we have to do it um i believe that uh, representative mcfawn has responded for the committee that we're most interested um but we need to pay attention to is what happens in the house so I'm now moving down to Romanet 2 House. This is on the bottom of page two. You'll see House Rule 51 provides the House's procedure to consider the proposal. Um, and uh, this section here for the House, this is what happened in the first biennium. So House 51A provides the House's procedure to consider the proposal. In accordance with the, this rule, the proposal is referred to the Committee of Jurisdiction. If the proposal is considered, the committee shall conduct a public hearing prior to voting on the proposal. If voted out of committee, the proposal will appear on the notice calendar for four legislative days and be up for action on the fifth legislative day. The House must concur with the proposal by a majority of the members of the House. Again, this is the process for that first biennium. Um, in other words, uh, that would be at least 76 House members must approve. Um, and you'll see that the House must concur with and cannot amend the Senate proposal. However, you'll see there is a process um, for the Senate to request the House return, uh, House to return a proposal before the House acts on it, so that the Senate could propose to further amend it. That did not happen in this instance during the first biennium. So <clears throat> um, then you have an interim publication section. So section 17 VSA 1840 requires the Secretary of State within 90 days following uh, adjournment to publish a proposal adopted by both chambers and a summary thereof in at least two newspapers having general circulation in the state. Uh, these publications must occur once each week for three six successive weeks. And then the statute also requires the proposal to be published on the websites of the General Assembly and of the Office of the Secretary of State for the same duration as the newspaper publications. So this is an interim step in between that first biennium and that second biennium, so that there is a public notice about these proposals. So then in uh, section B, now we're talking about this second biennium, which is where we are right now. And I will move down to the House, which uh, House 51A again applies in the second biennium. So the proposal is referred to the Committee of Jurisdiction. If the proposal is considered, the committee shall conduct a public hearing prior to voting on the proposal. If voted out of committee, it will appear on the notice calendar for four legislative days and be up for action on the fifth legislative day. The House must concur with the proposal by a majority of the House because the language is not dependent upon House membership, um, it indicates uh, it means a majority of the House quorum. So I won't get into too much of that interpretation um, since we do have the House clerk here to explain uh, interpretation of that rule. But um, 
In other words, at least a majority of the House members present in constituting a quorum must approve. And so, for example, if only the bare minimum of 76 House members are present to constitute a quorum, at least 39 of them must approve. So if there were 100 members present, 51 must approve. And just, um, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, in the first biennium, um, it passed the House um, on 103 to 38 vote. Um, and I do appreciate uh, the fact that, um, and Representative Rosenquist, this goes to a question that you asked yesterday. Um, if the proposal is uh, considered, um, the committee shall conduct a public hearing. Um, and your question was, do we have to consider it? Um, and I think the committee, the committee will be making an affirmative um, decision about considering it, but we will make that decision. We will confirm that decision. What was that again? I mean, I thought we had said there would be discussion uh, in committee yes. on this and that yes. there would be a public hearing. Is that correct? Yes, there will be. Thank you. And could I just ask another question that was pertinent to, it was having to do with, was the proposition published as according to that last section in the interim between these two bienniums? Uh, in other words, there was sort of very specific that at so many days, the Secretary of State was to publish this proposition. I was just curious if, if that had happened, if uh, Ledge Council knows that. Thank you. Um, I do not know the, the response to that off the top of my head. I'm, um, I want to give you an accurate uh, answer and if no one, um, if, if legislative council cannot uh, answer that at this moment, we will get an answer to you uh, quickly. Madam Thank Chair, you, Madam Chair. Why don't we just ask the Secretary of State, let, let, it, let him tell us, show us what he did. Okay. Thank and you. Have any, any arguments? We, it's clear. Uh, appreciate that, Representative McFawn. Good suggestion. Questions? I will, which it does not look like there are, I will just, I will continue um, now into section C on voter ratification. This is on page four of the overview. If passed by both chambers and both bienniums, the governor must provide public notice of the proposed amendment by proclamation. Uh, within statute in Title 17, Section 1844, the Secretary of State is required to publish the proposal and a summary thereof in at least two newspapers having general circulation in the state. These publications must occur once each week for three successive weeks. Um, and the statute also requires that the proposal be published on the websites of the General Assembly and of the Office of the Secretary of State for the same duration as the newspaper publications. The proposal is then submitted to the voters of the state for ratification. Voters must ratify by majority vote. Um, and uh, section 1842 of Title 17 requires the vote to occur at the general election. And the past practice has been for the voters to only see on the ballot the actual text of the proposed amendment, not the findings uh, that you see at the top of the of the proposal itself. So that is the process. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, are there, in terms of this um, high level overview, additional questions right now? I just was don't recall any findings having to do with this proposition, but uh, uh, maybe I'm wrong. I, uh, Within Proposition Five, there are findings prior to this. Um, um, uh, Representative Rosenquist, when um, uh, Legislative Council Michelle Childs goes through it, she can um, she'll address that. Thank you. Sure. Um, we have the House Clerk uh, with us, <laughs> um, Betsy Ann. Um, and if, do we have questions um, around what will happen in the House 
more specific to what has been gone through now. Representative Wood. Well, I didn't want our clerk to come here for nothing. So I'm gonna ask her a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, will the clerk make um, an affirmative announcement that there are a majority of the house members present um, in order to affirm that? Or will we just go on sort of normal practice and it's kind of like a, I don't know what you do. I mean, I presume you kind of like look around and see how many, but will there be an affirmative um, statement to that effect? Hello, good morning. Thank you, Representative Wood. Uh, for the record, Betsy Ann Rask, Clerk of the House. It would be like any other vote that you take. Um, so it's up to the chamber to uh, raise a point of order or a member of the chamber to raise a point of order if there's a question as to regard to the quorum. And our rule, our house rule doesn't uh, require a roll call vote like the Senate rule does. Senate, that's a difference between the two rules um, in one regard and to the method of voting. Um, but I, I did pull up the votes from last biennium on the two constitutional proposals that um, the house took. And um, I know that PR5 was taken by roll call, just like any other vote, um, a member can request a roll call. And I can quickly pull up PR2, which is the other one that's pending also. Um, I think they were both done by roll call, yes. Um, and I stand so, corrected. I was given a, um, a, a correction. I thought that it passed the house with, um, I, I understand it was 106, not 103. Yes. It was 06 to 38. I stand corrected to what I said originally. Thank you. Um, Representative McFawn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Betsy, I, I want to um, I want to make sure that we, the procedure for the committee um, br bringing it up, that the proposal was considered, how was that ratified? It's, it's the same, thank you, Representative McFawn. It's the same as any other piece of legislation with the committee process determining whether you take up legislation. So it's part of just your committee normal committee procedure for committing, uh, considering any other piece of legislation. So it would be done in order to, to solidify that, we would, um, it would be on our agenda and our agenda would be published. We would go through the public hearing, that would be of record. And then we would bring it back to the committee and we would vote on it. And that would mean that we have uh, considered it, correct? Yes, correct. And you would vote it out like you would um, any other piece of legislation, voting it out of committee. Yeah. And then once you do vote it out of committee with your committee report that you, your option is to vote it out essentially favorably or not because you're not able to propose any amendments to it. So it's either you you vote it out or you do not vote it out. If you vote it out, it's like a favorable committee report for a bill, essentially, if you wanna compare it. And then you would deliver it to our office like you would another, any other piece of legislation. And then the special notice provision then applies um, for the PR, if you vote it out, appearing on the notice calendar for four legislative days, and then would be up for action on the fifth legislative day for the vote on whether to approve it. All right, and I have one last question. Um, do we have to, how, how do we ensure? I just made a recommendation to get the Secretary of State in here and have him show us the document to make sure that that piece of it was done. Um, do we have to ensure that that was done before we, um, before we consider it? 
I don't, I don't think you're required to. I don't think that should constitutionally hold up the legislative process, but I thought that was a great suggestion to hear from the Secretary of State's office to confirm the notice that they provided. I do recall because there were the two constitutional proposals that um, the General Assembly did pass last biennium and being aware of this required notice process, I was pulling up um, I recalled working on this um, and working with the Secretary of State's office and our uh, IT department for posting the required notices. And so I do recall that happening. And it's my understanding that it happened, but it would be great for you to um, just check in if you wanted to check in with the Secretary of State's office to um, Thank you. discuss Madam the publication. Chair, I think it's imperative that we do those things. And I'll tell you why. On the slightest um, misstep, um, all hell is going to break loose. So I just want to make sure that as we as a committee do the job we're supposed to do, that we do it right and that those steps that in this Constitution, the way you change it, have been followed so that we don't have to deal with that. We're going to have enough to deal with. Uh, Representative McVaughn, I think you've made a great uh, suggestion uh, to have, and we, I will be uh, inviting the Secretary of State uh, to come in. Um, I do not believe that it will be today, uh, but it will be the next time we take this up. Thank you, thank you Madam Chair. Are there other questions for uh, before we move on to uh, Michelle Childs going through the language? Are there other questions right now in terms of the process? The process as outlined in the in the Constitution and the process as um, our our House rules. I, I guess I have one more, Madam Chair. Certainly. Um, and I can't find it in here now. But I, I thought that there was a certain amount of days that something had to take place. Am I wrong with that? I'm right. You're, 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 you're completely right. right. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, Betsy Ann, please. Oh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. <laughs> I'm just telling Representative McFawn, you're completely right. <laughs> uh, it's well, in the, the document. Thank, thank you to Amron uh, for the walkthrough and going through the document. It's at the uh, bottom of your page two of the document is your, um, or excuse me, we're in the, in the next biennium, pardon. It is um, at the bottom of page three. Um, it is the notice requirement, your notice calendar. It has um, a prolonged notice calendar requirement, unlike other bills. Okay. A constitutional proposal provides longer notice calendar. Um, uh, it needs to be in the notice calendar for longer than a normal piece of legislation. Okay, so we gotta make sure that. So, and, just pardon Madam Chair, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say, um, cause I, I, I'm, I'm a little concrete. So let's say if this committee were to vote out favorably uh, the constitutional um, amendment on a Tuesday, it would go on the notice calendar, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then the following Tuesday. And it would not be until that following Wednesday. You got that, it. Um, we would debate it on the floor of that. We would present it and then debate it on the house floor. That is correct. And it's just that one day's vote. And, and um, just to make, I, I'm not debating if that's right or wrong, but uh, it, so the fifth legislative day would not be Monday. Correct, unless we were meeting on a Monday. You know how at the end of the year we sometimes yeah. meet. So We've it all depends on when the legislature is in session. Is that okay? Yes. yes. Not where the committee's a meeting or anything. Just right. Yeah, okay. Sorry to be asking these things. I, I just, I want to make sure that all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted. It's a big deal. It is a big deal. And I, I appreciate that's what this is for. 
for all of us to have the opportunity to ask the questions and be clear, and for right now, to be clear about the process. I think we're good so far. And um, Representative McFawn, your hand is still up, but I think it's still up from before. Is that correct? Your, your hand is still up. I'm having <laughs> difficulty to get it down. <laughs> I think we're all good. Um, I really appreciate um, both of you uh, coming and uh, answering our questions, going through uh, the memo. Thank you very much, um, uh, Ms. Abergelli, and thank you very much, um, Ms. Rack, for um, going through that. Thank you. It's nice to see thank you. you. Take care. Yep. Um, and now if we can hear from uh, Michelle Childs, Legislative Council, um, and if you can walk through um, the, the language. Sure. So good morning. So Michelle Childs, Office of Legislative Council, and certainly for those of you who were here last biennium and had worked on this issue, you'll know I am new counsel to this issue and Bryn had been covering this for um, the last few years. And so I have big shoes to fill there. Um, I'm gonna be probably sending to Julie some of the memos that Bryn wrote previously um, and so that they can be available on the webpage uh, relating to, the, to Propo uh, Proposition 5. Um, and, uh, and I thought today we would just do kind of a high level kind of overview, taking a look at the language and, and talking about it. Um, and I know many of you are already familiar with it. Julie, um, or what's the, uh, Madam Chair, what's your preference in terms of, do you want the language up on the screen? And if so, Julie, would you mind doing that or? Um, I think it is on our webpage under, okay. under your, um, posted under your name. Um, I am checking to see if everyone is able to pull it up that way. And if not, um, and I'm looking in particular um, for those of us who um, are not quite as adept at others. And so uh, and Representative um, Brumstead, you had computer problems this morning. Are you able to pull it up or have, have you, do you have it that you can follow? I just went and got my iPad. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Um, and um, Representative Rosenquist, are you able to see the document? I typed in <coughs> PR5 uh, yes. and it came up and I have it on my iPad. Okay, okay, good. So um, sorry to go through that, um, uh, but want to make sure, and I, I prefer if I can that we can see each other. Um, so we don't, we're all gonna look at it and be looking at you. <laughs> okay, so I, I first wanted to just start out talking a little bit about chapter one of the Vermont constitution and how it, establishes the rights of, of its inhabitants and is essentially a constraint on government. Um, many of the rights in the, state, in the state constitution are the same or very similar to what we have in the US constitution. However, the state constitution can provide and does and at certain times provide additional protections for its citizens. And so an example that I would use um, that you might be familiar with is uh, relating to um, protecting its citizens from unreasonable search and seizure. So I think most people have heard of the Fourth Amendment to the US Constitution that's in the Bill of Rights. Um, and uh, Vermont has a similar provision, uh, which is in Article 11 of Chapter 1. Um, but that's been interpreted, the language is, is very similar, but slightly different. 
And that's been interpreted to be more protective than the Fourth Amendment to the US Constitution. So it's not, I just kind of wanted to start out talking about um, how they do not have to be the same. And so you could have something at the federal level that establishes the baseline, but the states can go above and beyond that and afford their citizens additional protections, which is what Proposition 5 does. Um, so, uh, so looking at the language, um, Section 1 of the proposal, and I think that this is what uh, perhaps what Representative Rosenquist was referring to, there aren't essentially findings, but there is a purpose section that you'll see in Section 1. And so this is similar to what you would see in a, in a bill where you might have an uncodified um, section right up front that states either a legislative intent or purpose or sometimes it's findings. Um, again, this is not wouldn't be uh, codified. It's not going to be in the Constitution. It's provided as background with regard to the purpose. Um, so I'm going to, because it's short and uh, the language is obviously quite important here, I'm going to do a little more reading of the language line by line than I typically do when, when I do a walkthrough. Um, so if you're looking at subsection A in section one for the purpose, this proposal would amend the constitution of the state of Vermont to ensure that every Vermonter is afforded personal reproductive liberty. And so you hear, hear these words liberty and autonomy uh, frequently in the discussion of Proposition 5. And these are terms that I think um, initially you might say, well, what does that mean? And I would just say that there is a long history of case law and jurisprudence around um, what these terms mean. And as I think as you continue to work on this proposition, um, we can dig into that as, as much or as little as you want. Um, and I know that those issues have been discussed in this committee before. Um, the second line is that the Constitution is our founding legal document stating the overarching values of our society. Um, the amendment is in keeping with the values espoused by the current Vermont Constitution. And then it goes on to specifically identify um, provisions in Article 1 and in Article 7 with regard to this particular um, proposition. So Article 1 declares that, uh, in part, all persons are born equally free and independent and have certain natural, inherent, and unalienable rights. And then Article 7 states that the government is or ought to be instituted for the common benefit, protection, and security of the people. That one may, sound, may uh, ring a bell a little bit more because you may be familiar with hearing about the common benefits clause, and that is to be in, to sure that, um, the, as you see in the next line, that the core values is that the state is to not provide uh, benefits and protections on certain folks um, while denying them to others and, um, and elevating certain people um, to be more privileged than others. The amendment would reassert the principles of equality and personal liberty reflected in Articles 1 and 7 and ensure that the government does not create or perpetuate the legal, social, or economic inferiority of any class of people. Again, this is really pulling from um, a lot of case law, US uh, uh, Supreme Court case law, jurors and, um, and the terminology here about making sure that people are treated equally and specifically looking at the reproductive case law with regard to the impact of regulation of uh, abortion and contraception and its impact on women. Uh, the next line, this proposed constitutional amendment is not intended to limit the scope or the rights of, uh, of those particular provisions. Sorry, I'm losing my place here in my notes. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so uh, just going back in subsection A on the term liberty, um, I just wanted to mention that that does appear in the due process clause of both the fifth and the 14th amendment amendments to the US constitution. And as used in the constitution, if you think about the term liberty, you wanna think about freedom from arbitrary and unreasonable restraint upon an individual. 
So section two is where we get to the language that will appear on the ballot or that will also be in front of you um, for voting. Um, section two establishes the right to reproductive personal liberty in the constitution through the addition of article 22. So that language reads that an individual's right to personal reproductive autonomy is central to the liberty and dignity to determine one's own life course and shall not be denied or infringed unless justified by a compelling state interest. Um, so I wanna unpack that language a little bit. Um, and something that you have on the website is uh, something that Bryn had um, developed last biennium and there are case notes um, for a lot of the terms that are with that are in Article 22 here. So, um, so if you look at so this first one being if we talk about um, what is um, uh, personal reproductive autonomy. So you know again, as I mentioned before, reproductive liberty and autonomy are concepts that come directly from the U.S. Supreme Court cases. Um, personal reproductive autonomy is a concept that um, derived from Roe, um, uh, the cases prior to Roe, Roe, and then the cases after Roe. And it includes not just the right to abortion, but also the right to choose or refuse contraception, the right to choose or refuse sterilization, uh, the right to become pregnant, and then of course the right to have an abortion. Um, so the amendment here in Article 22 establishes reproductive autonomy as a fundamental right. Um, government constraints on fundamental rights are considered to be presumptively invalid um, because they are uh, constitutional fundamental rights. Um, sorry, I'm having problems with my screen. <laughs> um, so... Uh, Government constraints on fundamental rights, as I mentioned, are presumptively invalid. However, the government can infringe on this right if it can justify its actions under what's called a strict scrutiny standard. Um, so this is the highest level of court review and is the one that the court used in Roe. Uh, under strict scrutiny, the state bears the burden of showing that it has a compelling state interest in the regulation and that the law is narrowly drawn to address that state interest. Uh, Roe applied the strict scrutiny to the right to abortion and found that the government's interest in regulating abortion became more compelling as the pregnancy advanced. So you're probably familiar with the uh, trimester framework and in Roe, uh, they decided that in the first trimester, the government had very little interest in regulating abortion. Um, but then in the second trimester, they had a stronger interest uh, and they could regulate abortion to further uh, the state interest in preserving um, and protecting the, the health of the mother. And then after viability, the government can prohibit abortion entirely due to its compelling interest in potential life, except uh, in cases where the life or health of the mother was at risk. Um, and then subsequently after that, lower courts upheld a number of restrictions on later term abortions. So, what this means is that if a future Vermont legislature or administration wanted to adopt a statute or a rule that infringed on an individual's right to personal reproductive autonomy, such as requiring that doctors who perform abortions have hospital admitting procedures. Am I frozen? Sorry. I, sorry, I keep going. I keep thinking I'm frozen. <laughs> um, uh, or if there were uh, like excessive waiting periods that were that were implemented, um, then that would come under a strict scrutiny analysis. Um, and the state would need to justify that action by showing that it has a compelling state interest that's achieved by the least restrictive means in order to be upheld. So that is my quick walkthrough. Um, so to um, <clears throat> to, uh, to to clarify, um, the first section will not be what is seen by the voters in November. What the voters in November will see is our, this section section, this second section, um, Article Twenty Two. 
I just want people to, people to make sure that they understand that. Yes. That, that's the point I was trying to get at. I wanted to make sure we understood. So it's a, just a part from Article 22 thereafter that will appear to the voters. Is that correct? That's correct. Section three will not. Section three will not appear. Right. Not the not the application, but our effective date. But just section two, Article twenty two. Thank you. Okay. Uh, questions for Michelle right now. Representative McFawn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to bring us back to um, when the federal, when the legislature, Congress, when they enact the law, the state can not do, they can do a lot of increasing uh, any restrictions or anything like that, but they can't do less in that law. Is that correct? Well, if you're talking about about rights afforded to to citizens, so the federal government can establish that the the states can go above and beyond that and provide additional protections to its citizens. Correct. Sorry, is that your question? Yeah. Yes. Additional, but not yes. less. Right. Okay, now constitutional amendments. Mm -hmm. This amends our constitution. Is there any place anywhere where the state has to abide by anything that the federal government has done in relation to the to section? I mean, Article Twenty Two. Are we making by doing that? Are we doing less to protect our citizens? Um, uh, I believe that it's, in, its intention is to do more, is to afford greater protections. Um, what's happened at the federal level is, I think probably as you've heard in previous testimony, is there has been kind of a whittling away of the, um, of the rights, uh, the privacy rights um, that were found in row, and there's been a different standard. They started out with a strict scrutiny standard that is what you have in Article 22, the court has shifted to a different standard over the years, looking at uh, new uh, restrictions with kind of a whether or not they're an undue burden on someone accessing services. Um, and so as there's kind of been a, a less and less recognition of those rights that were identified in Roe, then Vermont is stepping in and saying, we want to kind of basically enshrine the concepts and the rights in row within our state constitution. That way, if the US, if the US Supreme Court decides that, uh, that row, uh, you know, decides to overturn row, then those concepts and those rights that were afforded in row are secured by the Vermont constitution. I'm sorry, did that answer your question? Thank you. Representative Rosenquist. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Michelle, it seems mm -hmm. that, of course, all the protections we're talking about here are for, for women. And, um, and one reason I think a lot of things change. Hello? Sorry, can you hear me or not? Because I heard some feedback there. So anyway. uh, yes, we can. Okay, all right. Uh, there is no protections for the viable unborn child in anything uh, in this act or proposition. And I think that's been one of the issues where Wade is, or yeah, Roe Wade has been debated over these last years. There's more and more recognition that the 
unborn and viable child uh, should have some rights and protections. But this, this proposition leaves <laughs> out no protections for the viable unborn child. And it, it seems that, uh, well, anyway, I, just a statement, I guess, and uh, I'd appreciate your reaction to it. Um, well, I would say that the the amendment does encompass um, not just the right to abortion, but as I mentioned, um, there's a whole range of things with regard to reproductive autonomy. And so sterilization is one as well. So it, I think it wouldn't just exclusively be towards women. I just wanted to note that. Um, and then the other thing is that um, if you if you look at Roe, um, you know, the court there did find that the state had an interest at the third trimester um, in protecting potential life. And so there it did find, so as it went, as the, as the pregnancy increased, um, it found greater and greater state compelling interest that it then had to look and see whether or not the regulation was narrowly tailored to accomplish that interest. And so um, I, would, I would disagree that there is not any way in which the state could assert, you know, say that they have an interest in protecting um, a potential life, but that they would have to fit within the framework of looking at the strict scrutiny standard. you give an example of something that would uh, measure up to that scrutiny? Um, I, I don't, um, I, I don't know. I think I'd have to think about that. <laughs> I'm sure there's lots of people thinking about that one. <laughs> um, Representative Rosenquist, I will, um, I will give the answer that I gave on the floor of the House two years ago, which is it will depend upon the facts of the case and to um, to guess is um, sort of a, an, an exercise in futility, because in fact, what um, the cons what a constitute what what a challenge, what a legal challenge would um, a legal challenge depends upon the specific facts of the case. So, so a legal challenge would be made. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good. Um, would it be correct to assume that with this amendment, uh, a viable unborn child has less protections than they did prior? In other words, by putting this Proposition 5 in, we actually are taking away certain protections of a viable unborn child. I would argue that, um, I would suggest that we look at what we passed, what the legislature passed in, is it Act 57? I think it was um, 57. 57. 2019. Um, yep, it's codified in Title 18. Which is codified in Title 18. And, um, and I can send a link to Julie for that if you want to take a look at the chapter there. Um, but currently there are not any restrictions on abortion in, in Vermont. Thank you. I'd appreciate that link. Julie could send it to us. Thank you. Um, Representative Rosenquist, do you have your um, hand up? Do you have an additional question at this point? No, not at this point. I, in fact, I just took it down. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, Representative McFawn. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. The, the statement that you just made, uh, Michelle, that currently in the state of Vermont, there are no restrictions on abortion. Um, is that because of Act 65 or were there no restrictions on abortion except what was in Roe versus Wade? 
prior to that act. Right, correct. Okay. Didn't have any statutory. And when I say no restrictions, I do realize that there are um, uh, rules and practice with regard to how medicine is practiced in Vermont. And so I just, I'm just talking about from a statutory standpoint. Thank you. Uh, if we don't, this is only day, this is day one, and this was the introduction. If we don't have any further questions for Michelle, um, I'd like to um, have us talk, um, unless Michelle has something she wants to add for us. Um, I'd like um, us to begin to, uh, to generate a list of who we um, want to, who is, who is important for us to hear from as a witness. We will be having a public hearing um, and that was reinforced or clarified if anyone had questions by legislative council that that is a requirement. Um, and uh, Representative McFawn suggested that we hear from the Secretary of State um, and uh, yesterday um, I, I gave the suggestion that we hear um, <clears throat> from, from uh, Sharon um, and from the, uh, um, from the ethical, from, from right to life and from, uh, and we also hear from a representative um, from Vermonters for Ethical Health Care. Um, I think it's um, important that we hear from the uh, Attorney General Uh, I'm looking for some, um, if there are some additional, I want to make sure that if there are additional um, of that, that you let me know. Representative McFawn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would appreciate it if somebody from the University of Vermont, uh, the largest healthcare provider, that we have in the state. Um, I would like to hear from them in terms of the, the process that has to be gone through uh, before an abortion takes place. Um, I believe that we will be getting a, a letter of support from the, um, from the, uh, from, <clears throat> from the hospital. Um, and I think it's important that we keep the, um, if, if you would like to hear from a medical provider, um, we can talk about a medical provider, but a process, um, this is, I wanna reinforce what we are talking about is an amendment that is not, that is about reproductive liberty around the choice to um, the freedom to, carry, a, carry a, a pregnancy to term or not. It is about um, uh, use or not use of contraception and sterilization. And we would be do, doing ourselves and the voters a misservice if we narrowly focus on abortion. This is an amendment that is a wider span for reproductive liberty. Representative Rosenquist. Thank you. I, I had suggested before and would still request that Dr. Naska, uh, who has been before the committee before, yep. but since we have new members, I think it would be useful for Absolutely. us to hear his testimony, All right? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and as, um, Is he, I, and I apologize, is he, is, is he not from uh, Vermonters for Ethical Health Care? Is he an additional witness? Uh, quite frankly, I, I don't, don't recall if he is okay. in that organization. I mean, he's okay. a pediatrician that practices in, in the town of Georgia. Thank you. Okay, absolutely. Be, be, um, thank you for that um, addition. Um, 
I think you already mentioned that possibly Susan, or, uh, I, I don't know if that's her first name, but to, to Susan Tuborg from Right to Life. And uh, anyway, uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. there may be, may be some others I'm thinking on it and I will get back to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, my, uh, we have, we have begun to um, receive some written testimony. Uh, we received some written testimony from, I believe it is on our webpage right now. I have now. Oh, it's not quite up. That is not, it's not um, up yet. Um, when we receive written testimony from an organization um, and, they, and is asked to be submitted as their testimony, we will post that on our webpage. Um, when we receive public comment, um, we're going to do as what we have done um, with other pieces of legislation where there are lots of um, public comment. Um, there's a, there'll be a separate folder so that you can see them all together uh, in terms of that. Julie, is that, am I explaining it correctly? Okay, I got confirmation that I'm, um, explaining that in terms of um, where things are. Um, Representative Gregoire. You probably already said this and I missed it, but so when there's a public hearing, which is what's required, not the, the rest, um, how's that gonna look? Um, I'm assuming we're not doing it in person. Maybe, maybe we are. Um, have has stop been put into that? Um, I, I just curious so I can process in my head. I don't know why I did that process um, in my head about what it's going to look like. Um, a form, um, a specific date has not been um, identified yet. I'd be thinking maybe on um, the week, not and certainly not next week, because we need to give um, people notice. Um, thinking of the week of the 24th, um, where, what kind of um, public hearing, I imagine it will be this in a similar, well, we're not in control, the pandemic is, um, but right now I would, um, it would be the same structure and timing as the um, public hearing for Proposition 2 which is on notice right now for the week of the, for next week. And um, if you look on the legislative webpage, um, it says both in-person and virtual. So um, I have, um, where, where did you go? There you are, James. Um, so um, there, a, a formal date has not been um, decided. Um, aiming for uh, the week, the week of the twenty fourth, so the week after next, um, and it would be, and it would be from six to eight, which is when the so it would be at the same time as the other um, public hearing, and um, yeah. As soon as I, I don't think you meant that it would be at the same time as the other public hearing, as far as the actual time, right? Okay, so not, not on the same day. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Yes, um, I, I guess what I'm saying is it will the the structure of of the two public hearings that are related to a constitutional amendment will mirror each other, unless something happens with. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Um, Representative McFawn. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, 
I want to go back to my original uh, request for uh, people to commit to testimony. Okay. Um, if we don't have the University of Vermont healthcare system people come in, I would like to have a letter from them on the procedure that they use um, when reproductive uh, rights are being um, exercised. Because I know personally, they have a procedure that they go through for a man to do it and a woman. And I think it's important that the public knows that it just isn't willy nilly. Okay, so okay, so 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 your question is, um, what is the discussion, or what is the um, and and your and your question is is about. So I'm, I'm trying to understand your question. Your question. Well, let, let, me, let me let me just lay it out. Okay. Uh, let's say a man wants a vasectomy. There are certain. There's a certain process that you go through to have that. It isn't you just walk into the doctor's office and say, I want a vasectomy. Okay, okay, so the conversation that they have, okay. There's a conversation that takes place, you know, are you sure you wanna do this, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and in the woman's case, uh, the, there's a similar process that they go through. And um, I think it's important that the public knows that it, it just isn't somebody sneaking around the back of a corner and going into um, some place where they are providing abortions or sterilizations. Um, but that about, may happen. That may happen. I don't know. I haven't heard about it in Vermont, but it may happen. Um, but I think that the medical profession has certain things they do. Um, and, um, and I'll tell you why. People no, call and, me and say, I, I, Topper, I, I misunderstood the um, direction of your first question, and um, uh, and I will go back to um, UVMMC and um, uh, see whether or not um, that is something that they're able to um, do. But right now, um, um, in deference to how. How, how, how busy many people in the medical profession are. Um, I have um, I, I, I have said a letter would be fine. Um, but um, I get I get your question and if it's not someone from there or if a letter isn't <clears throat> isn't sufficient or maybe they can have someone come in, but there are other other medical professionals or maybe someone from the medical society. No, I don't want no. someone from the medical society. Okay, okay. Want you, somebody, want, you want a practitioner. That's right. Okay, got it. And, they, and I don't want them to come in and say, we support this. I want them to come in and say, here's what we go through. Here's so how we have that discussion. So the yep. public understands that it just isn't walking through a door. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um. This sounds good. Um, we will um, pick this up um, next week with uh, some of the individuals who are, we've now identified who we're going to um, hear from. And uh, today's, um, we're actually, uh, only a few minutes, um, according to our schedule, we were going to take a break at 10.30 um, because we're going to switch topics um, and come back at 10.45 uh, to hear from, um, to talk about COVID-19 and a public, public health response and sort of some broad overview. Um, but before we um, rush to do that, um, we do have a few moments and Representative McFawn, your hand is up now. I didn't know if you have a. No, I. That's okay. I get that it's. Just wondering, do we have uh, that spreadsheet yet that we're supposed to fill in for next um, week? 
during during our break, I will be working with Julie to um, to finalize that spreadsheet. Um, we probably wouldn't give it out until Friday because um, uh, we might get a few more bills on the list. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, we'll take, a, um, <clears throat> since we're not expecting uh, Dr. Leahy until 1045, um, we will be this, we will take a um, slightly longer break and be back.